Hi, and welcome to Newsmakers and a new season of inside analysis and behind the scenes commentary from Santa Barbara's top journalists about the most important news events affecting our community. I'm your host, Jerry Roberts. Tonight, we'll look behind these headlines. Political leaders, activists, and scientists from around the world gather to confront Donald Trump's denial of climate change. Santa Barbara City Council moves to decriminalize the use of plastic straws, still trying to escape a wave of national ridicule. Both sides claim victory in the Plains oil spill trial, and the number of empty storefronts on State Street keeps climbing. What's the city doing about it? Our panel tonight, Catherine Barnes, news producer for KCRW. City Hall reporter, Josh Molina. Nick Welsh, executive editor of the Santa Barbara Independent. And Tyler Hayden, news editor for the Indy. Thank you all for coming. So Catherine, the Trump administration has quit the Paris Agreement on climate change and is doing everything it can to boost uh, coal and the carbon energy in industry. And now we have the Global Climate Action Summit convened in San Francisco. What's uh, the significance of this conference? Uh, it's pretty significant. There's thousands of people in San Francisco right now. There are city leaders, state leaders, national leaders from around the country. And uh, it's, it's basically in direct defiance to, to Trump saying he wants to step out of the Paris climate deal. Um, it's mostly spearheaded by Governor Jerry Brown, so he's kind of taking the lead in this. And um, there's all kinds of people. There's the Prime Minister of Barbados is there, the Mayor of Paris, uh, mayors from cities and states and countries all over the place. Um, there's more than 300 events. There's a climate change ballet. Um, there's a hike through the redwoods to see how climate change is affecting the forest. So there's all kinds of stuff, but a lot of it is kind of this like schmooze fest of all these liberal environmentalists um, who you know want to make commitments with each other to, to do some change. But one of the stories coming out of it is all the kind of lefty protesters and groups that are attacking Brown for not doing enough, I guess? Yeah, so we have a reporter there right now, and he's basically saying inside all these conference rooms are these men and women in $2,000 suits uh, making you know, making these commitments with one another. But then outside you have, you know, the real people. You have these, you have these very liberal environmentalists from uh, California, but then also around the state who are saying, okay, this is all great, but A, you guys aren't doing enough. B, you're not putting a seat at the table for low-income communities, people who are seeing the effects of climate change really, really quickly. And, uh, and, and, and C, they're kind of angry that uh, there's this whole part of the business sector who's a big part of uh, the climate change conference. And, uh, and so a lot of the protesters are saying, you guys just want to make money off of this. Do you think that's true, or do you think that this network of people, as a practical matter, is doing anything uh, in terms of green energy that's, that's important? You know, I think it all is going to move it forward. I, I think that um, California, you know, being the fifth largest economy in, in the planet, um, if it says it, it, you have a consensus at the elite level and at the grassroots level, both saying we need to do more, uh, it can't do anything but help move that needle. And uh, I mean, the, the fact is that California has now adopted what a zero carbon uh, goal for 20, 2045. 2045. Mm -hmm. And I guess the elected officials and, and the government officials who are attending have all made some similar commitment. What does it all add up to? The, the how much car, you mean? No, I mean, just is it is it enough to make a difference? I think it could definitely make a difference. I mean, this is our, these are all commitments to, you know, these plans. It's like the city of Santa Barbara committing to, to renewable energy by 2030. It, it won't happen until you actually see it's them starting to make these changes. So right now there's a lot of commitments and agreements and action plans. But, uh, you know, once everybody goes back to their, their, their nation or their state or their city, we'll see if they become implemented. Do, do you know, is there an electoral aspect to this in other words you know this is we have trump and a, and, a, and a republican congress you know what we need to do as a practical matter is is flip the house or do something like that it doesn't seem too 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 political it's kind of just like 
hey, if the federal government's not going to do it, then we're still going to go ahead and follow through with the plans that the Paris Climate Deal committed and, and that we're committing. And so we kind of, we just we just don't need them. I mean, this is basically everyone who's there is from blue states or blue countries. Um, same with the protesters. They're mostly blue. So you don't see a whole lot of political division at the conference. Yeah. Here, here's what I don't get. Why do the... Why did the red state representatives w w not want to accept this? I mean, is it just because it's tribal and, and, and it's a... Well, you know, what you're seeing actually um, in Florida, you're seeing some Republicans actually trying to uh, talk about climate Ooh, change. Kelsey Brugger wrote a piece about one I of those congressional... Yeah. yeah. No, but it's, it's, it's um, you know... There are Republicans who are feeling the heat. If you're like in a low-lying place that's about to be underwater, um, it behooves you to at least acknowledge reality. So do you acknowledge uh, the reality now, Josh, here tonight, <laughs> that, that Helene Schneider was right about the blue, about the blue line? How so long ago, Jerry? Oh my goodness! I mean, you were think a, I was in town. You were a young pitching. man. No, you were a young man. But you know what's interesting is that it, it was funny. Like um, the city council is now deliberating about what do we do about sea level rise, and so right now they are projecting that they're going to have to deal with um, uh, sea level rise up of six point six feet um, by the end of the century, and it could actually be a lot closer to fifteen feet, depending on what the emission levels are. Um, so yeah, Helene was probably about 10 years too soon. Now. She was 10 years right. Well, and Jerry Brown was about 30, 30 40 yeah. years early on, on all this stuff too. Okay, well speaking of saving the environment, uh, you've been writing about the uh, banning of plastic straws in Santa Barbara and all the unwanted media attention that uh, was attracted. Uh, with the plastic straw, use a straw, go to jail ordinance. <laughs> I think, was that your phrase? I don't, I don't know. Anyway, what's, cooler heads have now prevailed. What's, what's the you, changes that are happening? Jerry, you just want to sip out of a plastic straw from your illegal vacation. Yeah, where are our straws? <laughs> <laughs> Times have changed here. Okay. So, yes. In You're in such a shill for this. <laughs> You just did an intense interview about climate change. You got to lighten things up a little bit here. Oh my goodness! Uh, in July, the council passed a ban on plastic straws, and what that means is that the restaurants and the businesses that sell plastic straws would not be able to give them out. They backpedaled because after they passed this, national conservative media, Fox News bunch of outlets basically framed it as Santa Barbara would rather crack down on people who use straws instead of homeless people downtown. So And immigrants. <laughs> yes, yes. And so sort of saying, oh, you care about this, but not about all these other issues. So it took on a life of its own. And for about a week and a half there, Santa Barbara was ridiculed. They were sent emails from conservatives all over the country saying your town is ridiculous, we're not going to go there. Many of the council members were asked to appear on these uh, national shows. All of them declined. But it was right before the council was, was going to go on, uh, on recess. So they were able to sort of not have to deal with it too much. What they decided to do, because national media said they picked up on the, the part of the proposed ordinance that said it would, could be a potentially a misdemeanor if a restaurant owner gives somebody a plastic straw. It was in there, right? It, it said it was a misdemeanor. It was in there. Um, now, as a practical matter, it's still one of your phrases, they, <laughs> the city says, oh, that would never happen. We're never going to actually put somebody in jail or well, charge them with reassuring. a misdemeanor. <laughs> but it's there. And so they met again uh, this week, the ordinance committee, and they extracted that from the ordinance and decided to push it forward. That was the three-member ordinance committee. There's still one holdout, Randy Rouse. He, at his restaurant that he owns, the Paradise Cafe, he says he's gone to paper straws, so it's really not an issue for him, but he believes that public education, public awareness is the best way to deal with this issue and that there should not be 
straw policing going around town. He thinks that people do a good enough job on their own rather than having an ordinance that tells people you can't give a straw away. So what did Jason say? Jason had a great line about Jason that. Jason Dominguez. Jason Dominguez. Yeah, so at the first meeting in July, he was for the plastic straw ban, and he said that, uh, unfortunately, common sense is not common, and we need to do everything uh, we can to, to regulate people's government lives. Government has to regulate like every aspect of people's lives. Yeah, yeah. yeah something like, that. unfortunately, gov yeah. government has to regulate people's lives. And he got a lot of flack from that. And he actually issued an apology a couple weeks Which later. Which was a non-apology. It was a non he, he, It was funnier than the first thing he said. He said, I put together a string of words, which sounded like Bill Clinton or something like that. He said, I put together a string of words that um, didn't come out right. And so he said, that's not what I meant. What I, I was, he said he was being uh, rhetoric, not rhetoric, yeah, rhetorical. <laughs> and, well, you know, Jason probably is going to run for mayor, and he, need, really? he needs... There's news. He I didn't need, know that. Well, you know, if I were advising, you know, if I were trying Which to read the, you are, but I mean, he's probably you're listening, Jason. <laughs> he's going to have that opportunity to run for mayor and still hold his seat at some point. Oh, yeah, so that's it's, right. they all do it, right? So he's probably going to do it, and uh, you know, he needs to appeal to a broader base. He needs to appeal to the people who don't like Kathy Murillo, and clearly that was a. You're never going to get the business vote if you go during right. a meeting and say that government needs to regulate every aspect of people's lives. Tyler, so why do, he backpedaled. Why, why do we care about plastic straws? How, how, how big? Because they're the scourge of the environment. I mean, but they are, they are bad. They're not, um, they're, not, they're not out killing people or animals. Uh, turtles, turtles, sometimes. And I was going to say on State Street or downtown. I mean, they do get out in the environment and they are a problem. Um, I mean, I. I mean, globally, is that is it contributing? They're one of the money? yeah. They're one of the right. One of the main polluters. Like if you if you try to um, categorize the different types of plastics that are out there, I think they're one of they're one of the worst. And I, I mean, as a consumer, as someone who is regularly downtown buying drinks, buying food, I, I get the public um, education um, point, but I don't know if I would like, like necessarily think of that when I'm. When I'm getting a drink getting or when I'm buying out. something, it's like someone kind of needs to stop me. I guess I agree with Jason. My life needs to be regulated at this point. Someone needs to stop me. <laughs> Every aspect. <laughs> yeah. Someone needs to stop me I'm from getting for a Jason. straw. Yeah. My life needs regulation. <laughs> Jason You've been in the shower too long. <laughs> yeah. Someone needs to stop the straw before it gets to me because I'm not going to think of it. Did we get rid of almonds? Yeah. Yeah. Trump's doing that. But no, I, I think it's a, it's a rhetorical uh, gesture that people have to sort of change little tiny aspects of how they live their lives in these mundane details and and you have a, an accumulation of that and sooner or later it does make a difference if you look at the mass weight of straws in the ocean it's probably just a, a speck but it's just another way we can change little things and make a little bit of a difference i just wish paper straws were better <laughs> held up better yeah. Yeah. in your cocktail pa yeah. i gotta say this paper straws are lousy yeah. uh, they, they, they just don't take, it's not the same. So basically you just have to learn to go without a straw. Yeah, or you get one of those like metal straws you can get at, at French Press for $8 or whatever. <laughs> you yeah. carry it around. You carry it around. Just but put then it, in it tastes like metal. Yeah. No, some people like the metal straws. And yeah. I think it's Ooh, interesting. I've, I've noticed this Anyone whole. Anyone on this panel? <laughs> I like the glass I haven't tried personally. them yet. Yeah. But I've kind of noticed this whole like straw shaming type thing start to happen, like drought shame or, or water water shaming, you know, when people are watering their lawns or something like that. You, you start to see people, you know, with straws and you're like thinking, hmm, mm -hmm. I so that really straw. like, oh, you're that kind you're of, kind of a jerk. Yeah. 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 Well, if you're in that the one, the one percent, then you go, I would like ice water with a plastic straw, please. Just yeah, maybe that. you'll have all these people in defiance saying, I have a disability, I need my straw. They, people have, the store, restaurant owners have to keep plastic straws on hand, though because people with a disability, if you say I have a disability, I need a plastic straw, they have to give them to them. So and they have to keep them on hand. Yes, mm -hmm. and uh, there's no proof, you know, if you want a plastic straw and say, you know, you need it for a disability, they're not going to make you prove it. Hmm. Um, so they're going to give it to you. So this is going to pass. Yeah, it's, uh, Randy's going to vote against it, of course, but yes, uh, maybe, who knows what Jason's going to say at this point, but there's definitely a, a council majority. 
<laughs> Council majority. And, and you can kind of say that any, any given week, couldn't you? Kristen Snedden's point, by the way, to your point, is Santa Barbara's a tourist uh, a city. Lots of people come here. We own a greater share of the problem. So it's different than some other city when it comes to a plastic straw ban. We're throwing more stuff away because we have a lot of people coming in. So there's you definitely votes there. That's what I couldn't believe is in your story the other day that Visit Santa Barbara got so much flack yeah. that they had to hire like an emergency crisis management. <laughs> oh, yes, yeah. they did. Consultant. And, you know, and it was if the person, one of the things was their person is very hostile and they're criticizing, you know, liberal, liberal Santa Barbara, hang up the phone. Hang it, hang it hang up. Yes, hang it up. That was one really? of the bullet points. Wow, yeah. wow. Yeah. Don't yeah. engage. And that was in my July story. I didn't rehash it for the most recent. Oh, okay. send, send them in. The archives. Right. Send them a subscription <laughs> to the Santa Barbara Independent. All right, speaking of despoiling the environment. <laughs> These segues. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> ba -dum -ba -dum. So uh, a jury convicted Plains Oil of 9 of 15 counts in the 2015, uh, coming from the 2015 pipeline spill, but only one felony. Right. So weren't they really the winners? Didn't they win by losing? You know, it's sort of like, are you a little bit pregnant? Or, you know, it's, <laughs> you're guilty. You know, you're a corporation, you've just been found guilty of a felony criminal count. So, oh, we didn't get found guilty on three. And what was that felony they were convicted of? For knowing or they either knowingly allowed or should have known they were engaging in practices that resulted in 142,000 gallons of crude oil spilling out of their pipeline and getting into the ocean. So clearly all of the top executives will be going to jail now? Yeah, Jerry and Harry. Greg and Harry will all be going to jail. No, nobody going. goes to jail. I mean, that was kind of an interesting sidelight uh, of the story, which is, uh, there was, in the initial indictment, uh, a criminal charges brought against one individual employee, a guy named James Buchanan. Charges actually were dropped uh, against uh, Buchanan because the prosecuting attorney sort of withheld information that might have sort of uh, put him in a better light uh, when the DA's got the uh, indictment from the grand jury. Exculpatory. Exculpatory information was withheld. So that That's didn't look word. so hot. I'm going to use that word more. Yeah. So, so uh, Buchanan walked. But the deal was Buchanan... So, do they, so do they, does Plains like have to pay a fine or what? Okay, here's the deal. Plains is going to have to pay somewhere 1.5, 2, 3, whatever million bucks in couch fine. Couch change. For them, that's going to be couch change. But when your good buddy, Barry Capello, uh, gets through suing them on behalf of the thousands and thousands of plaintiffs he represents in a class action lawsuit, uh, having nine criminal counts, one felony on the record, will aid his case I immeasurably. I see. So and he's going for how much, or how much do you think he'll possibly get? Who knows? I and mean, who, who, I mean, who's in the class? Who's in the you have um, fishermen, you've got property owners, businesses, uh, people who own, you know, beach property, anybody who was <clears throat> had to take a hotel room pra practically because uh, of the spill. How about uh, people who say, for example, vacation rentals? What would they, they, I'm sure, are going to be part of it. <laughs> yeah? yeah? Oh, yeah. yeah. You got the 800 number handy? No? <laughs> <laughs> so this is a big victory for Joyce Dudley then? You know, yes. I mean, if, if you could not win against an oil company in Santa Barbara... <laughs> Uh, you pretty much should go home. Um, and I have to say, to be honest, when I started watching this trial, which, for the record, was the most excruciatingly dull, existentially self-doubt-inducing experience I've had. More than the show. More than the show. <laughs> I was like, you know, what am I doing with my life? Um, it was so bad. He's, he's I, I, was, talking to me. I was thinking, what the hell? They're going to lose this. Um, they did not start off strong, but I think the oil company kept going, hey, you know, hey, you know well, we met well, you know. I mean, they had some of the best attorneys uh, with some of the worst arguments. However, we will all recall that it was your big scoop during the, um, during the spill that they did not have a shut-off valve. Automatic shut-off. And, of shut course, off. all of the legislation that was introduced at that time has gone forward and is now in place, correct? It's now in complete... Uh, Limbo. So yes, there was a uh, the, the pipe did not have an automatic shutoff valve, 
and it was the only pipeline in Santa Barbara County not to have one, and so uh, the valve would not have stopped the rupture, but it would have contained it. Doss Williams, your big friend, um, he got a bill through the state legislature saying pipeline companies must use best available technology. Obviously, this would be that. That was in 2016. Fast forward to 2018. The fine print has yet to be written. Uh, Did to the make, governor sign it? Like, the governor signed it, but the fine print that says this is what this bill this actually is means this is supposed to work. doesn't exist. There isn't even draft language yet. So the environmentalists are saying to Plains when they're, they're they have an application to reinstall a new pipeline. And, and the environmentalists are saying, Plains, are you going to have a shutoff valve? And Plains are saying, hey, we're going to do whatever the law says, but the law doesn't say that yet. All right. All right. I'm trying to think of a segue yeah, here. This, this is one. It's, uh, it's a State I mean, Street. <laughs> well, speaking of, of State Street. Street. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile. Speaking of corroded pipelines. Yeah. yeah. There you go. So you. <laughs> So you've been looking at a lot of uh, the, the multiple problems confronting State Street. And your piece this week, which everybody has to read, they hire this consultant who gives them a report on what to do two years ago. Then she comes back two years later and gives the same report because they haven't done anything. Yeah, that was, that was kind of striking. And I mean, she had sort of the general suggestions that everyone's been talking about, you know, make, make um, intermingle businesses, different kind of businesses under the same roof. It's all about experiential shopping. I didn't have it in there, but she actually suggested, I thought she was kidding at first, that for any store that sells winter clothing, um, that you should have a freezer in the middle of your store so that you can try on your jacket. I've been to one of those. They're pretty cool. Have you really? Yeah. They're pretty cool. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So there was stuff like that, but Instagram. She, that, that's what experiential shopping. I think that's a version of it. Yeah. Oh, I know. Yeah. I can never forget. Yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> but a couple of things that she brought up that um, that seemed to that should have resonated, I think, a little bit more a couple of years ago. One of them being a new. It's it's kind of esoteric, but a new funding model for our downtown organization that could generate a lot more money. And, um, and bring business owners into the fold more. So that the property owners are paying the fee instead of the business owners. Correct. So the, so the actual building owners, like you just said, instead of the, actual, instead of the tenants. Um, so that, that was sort of interesting. She brought it up two years ago. It could have been implemented by and now. Why hasn't it been? I, I think a big chunk of that has to do with um, our downtown organization, now called Downtown Santa Barbara. They actually started looking at it a while ago, but there's some really um, deep riffs internally there and there's they're a lot dysfunctional. of they're dysfunctional okay yeah they're dysfunctional That's <laughs> yeah they can't get along um so i don't I, so they, who are the they're, they're, there's like very conservative people that don't want to pay any correct I, and, and is that a minority is yeah that, uh, the way it was described to me is a handful of very vocal anti-tax people and can we name names or i would rather not right now because i only think i know a couple but i'm not totally sure <laughs> Tyler's um, phone number for those of you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that's that's a shame, and I th and I think it it, it it goes to the to the multitude of problems contributing to the State Street issue. But this, I think, um, it's a, it's not exactly low hanging fruit, but it's a very practical, doable um, step that could be taken to to generate more money for the downtown organization, which they could put on more events, um, could improve landscaping, maintenance, all that kind of stuff that that brings people downtown, that makes it look shiny and new and exciting, um, that they just don't, that they just don't really and do And what, what about Macy's? Where are we with Macy's? Um, Macy's is still empty. They, <laughs> <laughs> there's and a, you said there's more, there's more empty storefronts than... There's a Halloween store. There's a Halloween, yeah, exactly. And it, well, Ooh. a magic store too? Is that the same thing? It's world of, oh, world of magic. Now you're Big talking business. Josh's language. Yeah. Big money. Right. And then we're going to have Christmas at Macy's, yep. just like the old days. Yeah. Yes. Um, oh, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Oh, and actually, there's, there's cool going to be a, um, a talk there in a couple of weeks put on by the architects to, to discuss how... Uh, they're actually going to bring in someone from Santa Monica and bring in someone from San Luis Obispo to tell us... To know what yeah, they're doing. To tell us um, what we need to do, which is ironic. We were just talking earlier that um, years ago, our people used to be the ones recruited to go to cities to, to explain best practices, and now it's the complete opposite. We're bringing in folks to, to hear the, how they solve problems. Josh, you would agree with me, would you not, that one of the fundamental problems here is a lack of political leadership coming from the mayor's office? <laughs> well, you know, 
<laughs> we have a strong uh, city administrator model here, so there's not much the mayor can do. Well, Nina's doing a lot. Right? She's, uh, she gives presentations. You sound like you're in Angel Martinez's camp. You would, you would have been on the first plane to No, no. I don't Seattle know. Who were these or? guys that were doing the, they're trying to put four businesses where the Pete's thing was, and then they got the red mosaic. tagged right, the yeah. first day for what? For, they said they were doing too much uh, moving of stuff on the inside. They took out a counter. Yeah, they took out a counter. Welcome to Santa Barbara. Right. Open for business. I mean, to the city's credit, I will say that they, they're, they're trying some new things. They're doing this, these pop-up stores. They just had, they had an event the other night where they explained to, to retailers how they could actually make a pop-up happen. There's like 100 people there. Um, in Santa Barbara terms, that's, that's a big deal. They're going to have another one for property owners um, where they, again, will sort of explain the ins and outs of that. So, I mean, I will give them... So who's guiding this process? I think Nina. Nina. Nina Johnson, um, an assistant city administrator. She, it's, this seems to she's be her... She's a first rate. To yeah, she's, I think she's, she's great. She seems like she's got some energy behind this um, and is thinking a little bit outside the box and is willing to kind of shake things up a little bit, try new stuff at least. Um, but I think she's got her hands full with other projects and it's, it's not... Um, Government blames the, the property owners... Property owners right. do not want to lower their rents beyond what they've done, and they blame the government. And so nothing gets done because nobody wants to put themselves out there. So like Mosaic, these people are getting Mosaic. creative. Yes. Pop-up shops, let's do something that's not going to take forever for a permit. And people are getting creative. But um, long-term solutions, it's got to be cheaper for local businesses to have a place on, on State Street because government... You know, conservatives hate government running their lives, but they want government to fix State Street. It's, and it's, government does not sense the rents. I mean, right. Yeah. And is homelessness still a, a, a big issue that's being yeah, divisive? Yeah, it, it's an issue, but I, um, there's, there's some movement on new programs. Um, United Way is looking at um, reconnecting homeless to, to their family members, previous jobs, um, to, to kind of get them back on their feet. Um, I will say, I think the... the pretty vehement anti-homeless rhetoric that was out there for a while, that this can all be blamed on the homeless. That's kind of getting toned down a little bit, which is interesting. Um, people aren't just trying to, to push it all on them. But it's still, yeah, it's still part of the part of the galaxy probably, of problems. Probably largely because of your coverage of the issue, I would think that that's... Maybe, His sympathetic coverage, is what saying? Coverage. Well, yeah, it was kind of funny. The, uh, when the city council had its first big come to Jesus meeting in the council chambers on this. Uh, Dick Burdy, who is one of the biggest property owners downtown, and Jim Cannell, I guess the two of them together were about 80%. They talked about putting a couple hundred thousand dollars to get all the homeless from downtown to a plot of land off by the sheriff's uh, offices. No, that's uh, a good idea. Which is really going to fly. Here's the key question, Nick. When you're looking for experiential shopping, do you go to a pop-up store or a legacy retailer? <laughs> As a millennial, I will say oh. breweries will oh. will solve State Street. And, there's really? those and there are yeah. like five yeah. coming, so yeah. Yeah. problem yeah, solved. When in doubt, Just boom. keep drinking the problem. When in doubt, drink. Yeah. Yeah. Right. The folks right. don't have wine, we got beer. <laughs> right. Yeah. All right, once again, we've... Gone through an entire half hour. Well, thanks to tonight's panel, uh, Catherine Barnes, Josh Molina, Nick Welsh, and Tyler Hayden. Thank you all for watching. Please visit our website, newsmakerswithjr.com, and our YouTube channel, where you'll find an archive of our past shows and special interviews. Uh, thanks uh, also to our director, as always, J.P. Montalvo, and to our crew, Lizzie, Elliot, Herb, and... Mike. <laughs> and to our handwriting expert, <laughs> who can't figure out whether it's print or cursive, <laughs> our top ranking, high powered, high energy senior executive producer, Hap Freund. We'll see you next time on Newsmaker.